Okay, so let's. So I want to talk a little bit about about uh, continue our conversation from last week. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, patterns in oil spills. Um, we've we've seen this before, but just as a review, this is just a, a relative breakdown of some um, important from a management perspective, uh, environmental impact perspective, um, some important uh, oil spills from the past, and I've referenced everything here to the. Um, Deepwater Horizon, um, uh, by way of uh, what you know. So I, I, again, as we mentioned last time, things are typically in large oil spills. Things are typically represented in terms of the number of barrels, because that's how the oil and gas industry sort of the, their common unit. Um, again, we use the U.S. barrels, not the imperial barrels. And so for us, it's it's 42 gallons equals one barrel. And and uh, most of our conversations about this stuff. Um, and so again, uh, I use for how much oil came out of the bottom of the ocean during the Deepwater Horizon event, um, 208.5 million gallons. And that again comes from the flow rate technical group. If you were to Google this and look up what legally it'll say, it'll say a bit smaller because that's what a judge decided in, in, in a legal context. This was the, this 200, and 8.5 was decided by scientists. And so that I go with that number rather than the, the legal number. Um, but the point is, it was the main point is it was a huge amount of oil, right? Huge, huge amount of oil. And then um, the only thing that was, you know, so we have we have a bigger release here on my on my chart, which is again the um, Saddam Hussein's uh, sabotage of the oil fields in the wake of the first Iraq, uh, first Gulf War, um, uh, which was about, you know, a, a somewhere on the order of about one and a half-ish times the, the Deepwater Horizon. Um, very poor estimates in terms of the Kuwait oil field, as I mentioned last time, because uh, uh, we were just obscured. It was a war zone. There were so many fires burning, we couldn't get good satellite images. People couldn't go in till significantly after. So these are all estimates. Um, the Exxon Valdez spill up in Alaska, the Ixoc one in Mexico, the Santa Barbara oil spill, which we've talked about already, um, uh, in, in Santa Barbara in 1969, uh, the Torrey Canyon, which is the first big super tanker um, uh, uh, wreck and, and release of oil. And then, of course, the largest oil spill in U.S. history, which um, was not quite two times what was released in the Deepwater Horizon. Okay, uh, the only other one, I, uh, I added a couple more here uh, just for, for context. Uh, since in the last couple of years, one is the refugio spill on the Santa Barbara coast. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that uh, in the future. But basically, that is um, a super small fraction. Uh, similarly, the Orange County spill is a super, super small fraction relative to these large spills. Um, and so by, by just saying a super small fraction, just because it's a, it's a small amount relative to a gigantic release, that doesn't mean there, was, there were no impacts from this stuff, right? It, there, there were impacts, hyper-local impacts to be sure, but from a sort of large-scale perspective, it's just important you guys know that, that there are worse and, and less worse spills, right? So, so I think it's important to have that context. Not every spill is the end of the world, as it were. Okay, and then as we've said before, don't forget this, the largest spill, the largest U.S. spill is the Lakeview Gusher in 1910. Okay, so let's turn a little bit and talk about some of our policy, some of the policy tools, particularly at the federal level, to deal with this stuff. So um, uh, because of things like the Torrey Canyon and those things were happening, the 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill, by the time we get to the 70s, we start to see this first real wave of uh, in the start of the so-called golden age of environmental laws in our country, um, and in particular laws that specifically deal with things related to oil spills. And so I'm highlighting two for you here, the 1970s Water Quality Improvement Act, which um, essentially created the National Contingency Plan for how we would go about dealing with discharges. Again, one of the phenomenon uh, that... Uh, became very apparent during the Santa Barbara oil spill is nobody knew what to do. So the disaster happened and it was like, what do we do? I don't know. What do you think we should do? I don't know. Let's get some hay, throw it on the beach. Okay. Right. So, so the idea was, no, 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 we should, we should be, we should have people thinking about this ahead of time. 
and they should come up with some strategies. So when the, when the crisis happens, I go to the shelf and I pull the binder off the shelf and I turn to page one or page 10 or whatever it is. And like, oh my God, first step is this and that, right? And, and then, so first having that plan, next is starting to practice and drill. Okay, so when this does happen, how do I put out a boom to, to manage the oil or, or do whatever? So um, first step was having a plan and we first started to get that um, for oil discharges and other things and other chemical discharges in 1970. And then the big, one of the big, you know, mother ships comes in a little bit later, 1972, and this is the Clean Water Act. And the Clean Water Act did all kinds of stuff, was, was, was massively transformational. It's one of the most important laws we have governing our environment and environmental quality um, uh, in our country. And amongst other things, it gave uh, the EPA and Coast Guard broad powers to A, prevent, so if they see something that, that makes us vulnerable to oil spills, they can intervene. And then secondly, once, once there has been a release of some toxic substance, and oil being but one example, uh, we can, they can respond. They can shut down the plant or, or, or you know, enact cleanup procedures, that kind of stuff. So that all comes, so uh, the Water Quality Improvement Act, 1970, Clean Water Act, 1972. Okay, uh, other things, uh, come up in the um, in the 80s that that uh, take our attention things like the the energy crisis and all this and that and, and other things and we we sort of are in a quiet period in terms of oil spill policy for a while and that also continues throughout the early part of the 1980s the Reagan administration was a deregulatory and, uh, administration which meant they want to, wanted to have no new laws gut these agencies and do whatever they could um, uh, to, to not have, um, uh, they would not say, they would say they would want strong environmental protection, but they just think that regulations aren't the way to do it. And so, so that meant, that led to this very uh, clear eight year period with, with very little being done. Okay, but then by the end of the 80s, um, we start to get uh, uh, several things that begin to bring to the public's attention and therefore bring pressure upon our policymakers to maybe have some more aggressiveness about oil spills um, uh, in a very close succession. So we have this Pennsylvania oil, uh, oil storage tank collapses and spills a bunch of oil next to this river. Um, we have the Exxon Valdez spill up in Prince William Sound, which we've mentioned in 1989. Um, and then in June, a little bit later in 1989, in June, we have three major spills within 12 hours uh, at different places in 12 hours. So if people are just like, what's going on? We need to do something different. In particular, the Exxon spill uh, really drives a lot of our uh, worry and thinking and concern. And so that leads to, as I said last time, uh, so-called OPA 90, the Oil Spill Pol uh, Pollution Act of 1990. Um, and this is really uh, our, our you know, centerpiece centerpiece uh, oil spill legislation, uh, you know, going forward. So this fundamentally changes our oil spill response in a couple, di in several different ways. We could probably do a whole class just on Open 90, but, but suffice it to say, first and foremost, it strengthened the, regulator the regulations and the authority of different, of different uh, federal actors to engage with one, spill prevention, two, when we are in the midst of a spill unfolding, um, really set the, the table for um, the official response and the structure for the response. And then, um, and so really this, be this became very much like a, um, a, a, a wildfire where we have this um, quasi-military sort of structure, very hierarchical and everybody has their job and they're all underneath like a single command, that, that type of stuff. So very much like a paramilitary uh, sort of uh, type of command structure, um, and and then and then after the spill happens, what are we going to do uh, after the spill? Um, uh, it also requires uh, anybody that's making, in this case, oil, producing oil, refining oil, shipping oil, whatever, a vessel moving it, uh, an area that's storing it, an area that's processing it, what have you, they have to create spill response plans. <laughs> and they have to be approved by um, the government. 
and they, these folks have to test regularly and practice their, their deployments of equipment and personnel and train, 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 train. It also established a trust fund um, uh, that's funded by a tax on oil and gas to create a contingency plan to deal with spills when the so-called responsible party, that would be the entity that, that, the, that caused the pollution, so the shipper, the oil, oil company, the refining company, you know, whatever, um, the responsible party, if they, if they are unable or unwilling to, we can sort of engage in cleanup. That's a little bit of a joke because the amount of money we really need is, is usually orders of magnitude more. But it's enough that if it's a relatively small spill with a producer that went, goes bankrupt or something like that, you know, we, we have some resources to immediately deploy. You don't have to wait six months for an uh, appropriation from Congress type of thing. Uh, and then uh, uh, even more uh, area contingency plans for oil spills. So rather than just the, the refinery dude having to make it, rather than just the, the you know, whatever, the, the source of the polluter, pollution having to make a plan, we have to come up with these regional plans. So in our, in our part of the world, um, Ventura Fish and Wildlife, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Office, is a really strong coordinator and they pay for training for people like me and other people that aren't necessarily their agency people that, so that we have a bunch of cadre of experts should a, should a spill happen that people are trained and can help with response and, and things of that nature. Um, and that's, that grew out of OPA 90. Okay, in the wake of OPA 90, not a whole lot has happened. Um, so in the wake of... Uh, OPA 90, uh, the, the, the biggest ch change has been um, that, that, that sort of paramilitary, quasi-military structure is still in place, but now it's got subsumed under the so-called National Incident Command Structure, um, which was created after 9-11 to deal with anything, terrorism, earthquake, uh, natural disaster, uh, 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 whatever, right? Um, uh, in addition, um, so as you know, as you guys correctly responded, many of you on your quiz today, about the federal agency that, that's uh, most typically in charge of an oil spill when it's in the in marine setting is the Coast Guard. And so this, the Coast Guard is squarely planted inside Homeland Security, right? So this sounded great when, we, when this was prefer, pr proposed to some people. Um, sounded great to some people. And so it created a big, the largest reorganization of the government um, since, you know, in like a century or so, right? So we took all these different agencies, put them under Homeland Security. The idea was we're fighting this war on terror. All these people are trying to slaughter us from all around the world. We need to have everybody working together. In effect, what that seems to have done is that's made some agencies that maybe aren't super powerful, maybe like FEMA and other groups like that, um, they maybe get lost in the bureaucracy of, uh, or, or the, a common criticism is that they're lost in the bureaucracy of Homeland Security because it's so big and so massive. Um, but regardless, that's what we have. Uh, agencies have issued new rules um, in the wake of, you know, since 1990. It's not as if nobody's ever done anything, but there's been nothing as massive as that, that, that shift as that uh, open 90. Historically, when we saw large oil spills, Santa Barbara oil spill, Big, big new law, big policy change. Exxon spill, big new policy change. Deepwater Horizon, nothing really. Um, my colleagues in the government say, no, 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 it wasn't, no, no, it wasn't nothing. But relative to history, especially for a spill that scale, not much has happened. Uh, so for example, since... Since uh, 1990, the oil and gas industry has spent something on the order of about $17 billion to deal with new regulations and compliance. $17 billion is nothing to sneeze at, right? That, that's a lot of money, so we should be clear. It's not as if the oil and gas companies have done nothing. They've done a lot. They've done a lot to, to create spill response plans, to, to change some of their uh, activities, et cetera. However, it is also true that that money to deal with the bad side of things is massively, massively, massively dwarfed by the routine spending on how to, for example, get more oil out of the ground. And so um, 
I just grabbed some uh, data this morning, which was a just for Exxon and just since 2001, so not even all the way back to 1990, but, but just for the last 20 years or so, um, they've spent something on the order of $26 billion on R&D, right? That's not, that's not on like doing drilling, that's just on the research to figure out how to get more oil and gas. And that's but one company for a small part of the, the history. So, so it is true that the oil and gas industry has, spent, has put a lot of resources into dealing with spills, but it's dwarfed by the amount of resources that are going into getting more oil and gas out there. So I think that's important for you guys to understand. And then one of the last big, big milestones of Open 90, it required... So one of the issues, we haven't really talked about this yet, but one of the issues with these with the Torrey Canyon uh, and, and these other tankers has been um, they run aground and and you know so if I have you know Victor's uh, Yeti here if I if I if I pop this a little bit with a nail or something pff, the water would come all out right so the idea there is have an extra layer of protection have a so-called double hull have a hull inside the hull so if you outside run into a rock or or get banged by a ship or something of that nature, um, you have an additional layer of protection that keeps that liquid, in this case oil or gas, inside protected. And so by 2015, any tanker operating in U.S. waters has to be by law a double hold tanker, so an extra level of protection. Um, so that, that's, uh, that's happened last decade. Well, I mean, mostly it already happened, but this, but the last few, you know, there, there were some occasionally somebody operating, but no longer. If you have one, a single hole, you're not allowed to sail into U.S. waters uh, as of now. Okay, um, what did happen in the wake of our you know, most recent large oil spill? Not a whole lot, but these are the things that did happen. Um, the most high power, okay, okay, it's important to say that the Minerals Management Service, which is the federal agency, sorry, any questions about that so far? Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay, um, most of these other things, EPA, um, uh, NOAA, all these guys, these guys are all create, these organizations, these agencies are created by Congress, by statute, right? Hey, so we're, we're this law says create the EPA, right? So Nixon famously was the president that, that uh, got the EPA going and, and approved the EPA. So that was created by law. We have to have an environmental protection agency by law. The entity that was managing things like offshore oil and gas, the so-called Minerals Management Service, was never approved by Congress. It was created um, as, via executive action, via executive order. So it, it was domiciled within the Department of Interior, but it wasn't required to be, you know, no law said create the Minerals Management Service. So a lot of people view that as a bad thing. It, was a small, it, is, it remains a small agency, doesn't have a huge staff, doesn't have a lot of people, that kind of stuff. Um, but in this case, it was actually really helpful for when we noticed there was a problem, the president at the time, um, uh, President Obama, could just sort of say, let's reorganize, and he could just do it, right? Didn't need Congress to act. And that's what happened. So the Minerals Management Service broke apart into, generally we think of these, these two main entities, but it actually broke into three, uh, three things. Um, the Office of Natural Resource Revenue is just basically accountants. They handle the money. They get the, the, they get the dollars. But, um, but the main ones are Ocean Energy Management and Bureau of Ocean Safety. So o Ocean Energy Management is the entity that works on a, you know, leasehold. Somebody wants to have an oil and gas lease or an offshore wind lease. They're the entity that does all the studies, figures out whatever, you know, decides like what, what big, how big the parcels will be, that kind of stuff. And then, and we, and we, and we pronounce this BOEM, the, the, the acronym you say that is BOEM. And then this one people say is BESI, as if there's an extra E in there. So BESI. Uh, and, 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 and they do all the inspections. So the, like, hey, is this, is this pipe being you know, cleaned properly? Is, are, there, are we free of leaks? That kind of stuff. And actually, the West Coast head of both these agencies is right here, you know, a 10-minute drive from campus. So we're pretty lucky that we have those guys right here. Great opportunity. Uh, there were other changes. I personally think they were quite minimal, especially, again, relative to the scale of the environmental impact. But um, we had some changes to OSHA laws about workers on platforms. We have some new uh, requirements for blowout preventers, which was the device that sat on the pipe that was supposed to 
work to to stop the oil and get like, essentially like emergency scissors and pinch off the pipe, which didn't work. Um, we have some additional evaluation of of drilling rigs that are very that are doing very deep drilling. Um, essentially, we just uh, required them to go under the full review like they should have gone through anyway. So not, not particularly big. I would say one of the most important ones, and this, isn't ex this is not a, a policy, so this is a bit weird here that I have it in the policy area, but, but I would say that in places like these heavy oil and gas areas, like Louisiana, where the Deepwater Horizon happened, disaster capitalism has really become the de facto policy in many contexts. What do I mean by that? What I mean is there's many, many issues with uh, Louisiana, maybe if you guys come with us to Louisiana this spring, maybe you, you'll, you'll see some of this, but basically, um, uh, lots of challenges. So the, we in California have the greatest proportional loss of wetlands of any state in the U S Louisiana has the greatest absolute quantity, the greatest acreage, the greatest, um, you know, just absolute amount of wetlands being lost, um, because of our coastal management uh, practices there. Rather than, rather than restore the wetlands, as we should, in fact, the oil and gas folks there are required by law when they impact the wetland to restore it. They just decided they didn't want to do that. And then the state legislature changed the law to say, yeah, you don't have to follow your contract. You don't need to restore the wetland. It's, 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 it's a pretty... Pretty crazy place. Um, but, but so what's happened now is this idea of disaster capitalism. And so we see this in Louisiana. We're starting to see elements of this in Florida. We might be seeing, uh, we don't quite see this in California yet. But, um, and this is when we have these major disasters, climate change, wildfires, oil spills, whatever. Um, uh, the, the, the responsible party or the whoever is, is paying the bills comes in and offers money and then the folks that are there, like, ah, this is the answer, right? This is the answer. So the money from the oil spill will help us with our ongoing management of, of why we've lost wetlands, you know, that type of thing. And it's pretty crazy, right? So, so the oil and gas impact should pay for the oil and gas impact, right? But it's increasing, it's typically used for all the other things. In addition to that, all the other failings of coastal management. And so, in other words, these folks kind of become dependent on money from disasters, which is which is a dangerous thing to do. Um, but that's that's the only thing that's really happened uh, in terms of uh, real policy wise. The, the, you know, again, if you talk to our colleagues in these different agencies, they'll give you a list of like twenty different things that were changed, but they're very minimal. They're they're uh, kind of under the hood type of things. They're not major, large scale. The biggest thing that happened initially was pre uh, President Obama induced a moratorium on drilling, and People didn't like that. So they're like, no, 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 no. Uh, I should also say, oh, I, you know, the one thing I did forget, I, I, I should have mentioned, yeah, I should put this in here. This is lame. I didn't put it in here. Uh, I would say this would go in um, like this 80s era, which is one of the responses to the, six, to the 69 oil spill, at least in places like California, are oil drilling bans. And so one of the ways that's enacted is through uh, uh, national marine sanctuaries where oil and gas extraction is not permitted. And so uh, you know, Channel Islands National Marine uh, Sanctuary, uh, 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 Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, these things are partly in response to this oil spill stuff. And so we did, so since then, we have, if people have existing leases in, in the waters, um, uh, oil and gas company has, has, an, has a, um, a lease that they've bid on, they can keep drilling there but no new leases have been issued uh, since this era. And so, at least in California. The, the Trump administration tried very hard to change that and to, to allow there to be oil and gas, but it didn't work. And so, so I'd say the moratorium on drilling is also a thing, but it's not, a, um, it's not necessarily required by law. So that, that could theoretically be changed. What's a moratorium? moratorium is to not allow it anymore. So, so an oil and gas... Uh, so an oil drilling moratorium would be no, nobody can drill oil and gas. Cool. Questions? Okay. Uh, so 
Now, that, that was a bit of me just talking for a while. Let's get into you guys doing stuff. So let's talk about um, uh, what oil and gas, uh, uh, what, what, what oil spills are like. So um, we're going to do an exercise now where you guys are going to look at patterns of U.S. oil spills over time. And, uh, and you know, to see if, uh, hey, maybe, maybe one of these policies uh, maybe had an impact in the wake of this policy. Maybe there was less fewer spills, maybe there were more spills, you know, what do you think? So let me ask you guys, what do you think the general pattern over time is going to be for oil spills, say, in U.S. Uh, uh, US territory? I would hope they would decrease, but maybe okay. back in the day they didn't report all of it, so. Okay, so yeah, maybe over time, every, every few years, on average, we're getting fewer spills on average, okay. That's a that's a good guess. Any other any other thoughts or any other predictions? I think it might get worse. Ooh, okay. And why might you think it so so I presume Carson's thinking it would get less because we have um, policies to try to make it make it less likely for spills to happen, but what's the argument for it being uh, more? We have more technology to deal further and mm. worn out. Okay, good. So even though we're having some some guidance to be more safe, the quantity of the activity might be going up. So good. Good, 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 good. Other thoughts or other ideas might be going on. Okay, well, we can check those out. So let's talk about what we're going to do. Um, so I've grabbed some data from the... Um, uh, so I, I'll just say, so I, I've tried several years, for several years, one of the things when I, whenever I retire one day, I'll do this. I've been trying for a long time to create a huge database of oil spills across the planet. And various friends of mine at different times we tried, it's very hard. It, it, not everybody reports stuff and it's, it's hard to have a consistent thing. So for the purposes of today, we're just going to look at U.S. data. And this data is coming from um, uh, an office within NOAA, the spill response uh, office. And, um, and their historical, chem so this is both oil and chemical spills, so anything sort of released on or near the water, basically. Um, and if you're bored, you can have fun and look through the database. You'll see things like, uh, every once in a while you see like a dead body or a whale or fish guts or something, but, but mostly the vast majority of stuff we're talking about here are industrial chemicals or oil and gas. Um, and so you guys can go this and, and, and find it, and that's what I did. I just clicked this little thing that says index, and I called up the, the data on this next uh, table, and I was able to download the data for you. Um, these are what the, there, there's other fields, but these are the main fields. So when you look in here, there'll be, there'll be like a unique identifier, a, a unique ID, so that every spill has its own, its own number. Um, and then the, the open date. Now, it's a little bit funky because um, especially back in the day, historically, we weren't track as many of these historic databases are. Once we decide to do this, you and I to talk about this, we come up with our criterion, and going forward, it's pretty good. But getting historic data is problematic because we weren't monitoring it then. We clearly missed uh, the vast majority of stuff, probably whatever the topic we're talking about. But there's also the issue of, well, how do they measure it? They didn't use our techniques. So there's a lot of, a lot of issues with hind casting, but these guys kind of to try to take a stab at it. But, but as you'll see, the historic data is not, not super great. Um, and this is the open date. So also, in some cases, there could have been an oil spill, let's say, that started in December and was leaking, but uh, nobody reported it until February or nobody discovered it until February or something, right? So February would be the date in this, right? So it's when it was first sort of actively reported to the federal government is, is that date. Uh, and there'll be a name, there'll be a location, a Latin lawn, um, and there'll be some tags and stuff, and then there'll be some other, other things about uh, stuff. The, the main thing that we'll look at is the max, maximum potential release. And so maybe that's what was released. Maybe, that, maybe something less than that was released. But, but it's, it's a way to just sort of have a, a, a picture of what scale we're talking about is, okay? Um, and I just note it's in gallons because it's the US. Okay, and so this is, when you open up the folder, this is what I've made for you. So I've changed this data file to make it a little bit easier for you in one of our first data exercises, right? So um, I've added a couple additional columns. So the columns, um, 
that I've made orange here or tangerine and bolded, these are not in the original database. So I've, I've updated the data for you. One is, so, so, okay, so here on the left, or we're year, this is the year again it was supposedly reported, right? And then I have one that just sort of bins it by decade. So all the years of decade of 1960s have the 1960 in this column. I've also done it by a five year bin because I want you guys to look at things over time. And it, it is probably gonna be easier to look at it either by decade or five years. Decade might be a little bit coarse maybe, maybe, but you can explore. Maybe decade is fine for your question. Maybe, maybe every five years. So I did that. And then um, the other thing is you'll see, so let's look right here, commodity, diesel oil, Kuwait crude oil, Venezuelan light oil, Kuwaiti crude, it, it gets complicated. Um, there is a category right here where it says threat and it says oil, 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 oil. So note that, that uh, this row here says oil, 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 oil. But if we go just above it, the spill was Kuwaiti crude oil, but it doesn't say oil. So for whatever reason, that didn't hit their criterion of oil, but it was absolutely petroleum, right? And so I've gone through and I've put a one or a zero in this new column of mine and so if there's any oil associated with the spill, I put a one in there. If, if it was something other than oil, I put a zero. So you can use that to help you sort the data um, if, it was, it was oil, if it was petroleum or not. So um, also if it, was, if it was natural gas, right? That also counted. Uh, that counts for me, whereas that, they don't call that oil. And then there's a few things where it's a combined thing that, that oil was part of it but they didn't bin it as oil. And I, so even if there's just some oil and gas in there, I called it an oil and gas spill. Okay? So there's some assumptions there, but that'll hopefully help you guys. Does that make sense so far? Everybody okay with what we're talking about? Okay. Um, so again, we're look, I want you guys to see, start playing around, see if you can hunt for the pattern of spills uh, over time. What's going on? Are there more spills, less spills over time, et cetera? And how does that sort of roughly jive with what we've outlined in terms of the eras of modern uh, oil spill policy? Now, whenever you do this, and this is anytime I give you guys a data set or anytime you're in Capstone or anybody else's class, this is how I think you guys should proceed. So this is generic guidance. Before you do anything, before you do anything, so one of the problems is when we start having these tools that we can do easy graphing, some of you guys are like, I'm gonna graph this and throw this in there and barf it in, blah, blah, blah. no. No, 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 no. First, just look. In, the, in this case, we have a, a CSV. We have a tabular data file. Suck it into Excel and just spend a minute, just look around. What are the variables? Do I know what those variables mean? Okay, let me make sure I know what those variables, what are the units? Is that gallons? Is that barrels? Is that kilograms? Like what's, what are the units, right? So make sure I understand what those guys are. Um, and just get a big picture. Okay, hey, so it looks like a lot of data is missing in the 50s or or you know, that, you know, just, just poke around for a minute, right? Get a sense of what's going on. Then once you have this big sort of picture about what the variables are and this and that, then we get into data cleaning and pre-processing. So then you might need to do some adjustments. Again, I've done some of this for you by having these years and the petroleum or not, so you guys don't have to do that to save you time. But there might be additional stuff that you want to do or you need to, you need to adjust the data or bin the data or, or, or do something like that. Then once we've uh, looked at it, we've done our data cleaning, we probably wanna do some initial, initial quick and dirties. Hey, what's the biggest number in this data set? What's the smallest number in the data set? What's the average value of this, you know, that kind of stuff. So, so take a stab at that. And then once you, once you kind of start to get a picture of it, then you guys can ask your questions. In this case, I've sort of started you off on questions, but there might be additional ones. So hey, I wonder if this goes on in California. I wonder if it's the same thing in Texas or the same thing in New York. That, that would be a possible thing you could pop, you know, do. Um, and then once you start to have those questions, I want you to sketch. Again, this is my general suggestion for everything. Sketch with a pen and paper or a, a iPad with a, with a Apple pencil or something. Right? Like not with the computer program, with your mind. Right, draw it out. Okay, so okay, I think this axis I'd want to be this variable. I think this axis I want to be that variable. I think it would, I kind of would you know, want to do like a line chart. I want to do a bar chart. You know, just sort of sketch it out real quick in your head. Okay, this is what I'm thinking. This is, this is how I think I could test that hypothesis or look for this pattern. Only then, only then, after you've got all that, then should you kick over to your first quick and dirty, quick and dirty uh, graph. What I mean by quick and dirty? I mean, 
let's just try making a graph. Don't have to worry about having the font super big. Don't have to worry about all the labels, but just like, hey, what is the data? Can I make the data do what I what my sketch look like? Yeah, I can. Okay. Then once I do that, then I can start to reiterate or start, start to iterate. So okay, cool. Now I okay, now I want to make the the font a little bit bigger. I want to make the colors easier to read. We kind of go back and forth in that iterative process. So that's the pathway forward, right? The pathway is never grab the data from Dr. Ray and throw it in and graph it and done, right? It's a process. And this is what you guys will do when you go to your job. This is what you guys will do when you go to your agency or whatever it is. And so get in that habit of starting off mile high, make sure I understand stuff, make sure everything's making sense to me before I start to do anything, do a little cleaning, and then sort of get into the graphing. Does that make sense? Questions? Okay. Um, you are, uh, my recommendation for you guys to do, uh, in most cases when I give you data, um, it'll be in tabular form, like a CSV file. Um, I recommend you guys use Excel. Um, you can use other programs like Google Sheets and stuff. Nothing is as powerful as Excel in terms of the data cleaning, manipulation, all that kind of good stuff. And so um, I prefer you guys to use Excel. As far as data visualizations, I'm gonna, I, I will um, show you guys Plotly, which is a browser-based graphing program for basic graphing. Um, if you want to use R, love for you to use R. How many of you guys are comfortable with R right now? One, two, and a half. Okay, so again, you guys can use R by all means. I do not, if, you, if you're good with R, knock yourselves out. But as that just showed, most of you guys are not. So I'm just gonna, I'll talk about Plotly, but by all means, you guys are more than welcome to, to, to use a more advanced program. You're not, everybody look at me, you're not allowed to use Excel. You're not allowed to use Google Sheets to make the figures. You got to use something more professional. So at least Plotly or something, or, or something Plotly equivalent or better. Okay. And then I don't know if we're going to have time to get to this in this exercise, but I also want to start doing ArcGIS online. So you guys can start to look at another options and start to see where these, where these uh, spills are in space. And let me just ask you guys, how many people are comfortable using ArcGIS online right now? Okay. So most of you guys. Okay. So that's cool. That's cool. I just was trying to get a feel. All right. Great. So perfect. So with that, I think uh, we can turn back and start to uh, start to look at our data. Um, so this is an assignment in our module that I turned on this morning. It should be in there. It should be published. If it's not, let me know. And there's a link in there to the data file. So you can just, in that assignment, you guys can just click on it and download the CSV. Cool? All right. We can take a 10-minute break if you guys also want while you, uh, while you get going. If you need a computer, let me know and we can uh, go get one for you.